It's time to go on the record with WRAL News. This year, the winner stands clear. North Carolina, the Tar Heel State. The results are in, and North Carolina is number one. CNBC naming our state best in the country for business, declaring North Carolina's economy has hit its stride. We discuss with some of the state's top business leaders. Plus, I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't I think care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. The House Select Committee investigating the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol could wrap up its historic hearings next week. The major takeaways thus far with local political experts who put the testimony into context. And thank you for joining us for On the Record. I'm Lena Tillette. It certainly is good to be back after taking a few weeks off, and we have a lot to get to this week, beginning with this headline, no doubt, taking the number one spot for business is a huge distinction for North Carolina, and the business world is taking note. Look, we pulled together in a bipartisan way to make sure that businesses know that we've got the most talented, educated workforce in the country. And talking to CEO after CEO, workforce is the driving force for them right now. There's a lot to talk about in terms of the recognition, a lot good, some notable challenges for the state as well. Our panel tonight understands our local economy and business environment better than most. North Carolina Commerce Secretary Michelle Baker Sanders and Jake Shepard with global recruiting firm Vaco Built, which helps companies in our area in every sector find strong employees. Thank you both for joining me. Secretary Sanders, I'll begin with you. Quoting from the CNBC article, uh, CNBC article about the state's success. It says, um, for one thing, state leaders keep managing to put aside their very deep political divisions to boost business and the economy. How are you able to set aside differences? We are able to set aside differences, Lena, by uh, remaining committed to the reason we're serving, to do the best that we can do for the state and for all the residents of the state. And we all want a thriving, booming economy. We want good paying jobs. And we want North Carolina to continue to be recognized for the great state and the assets that we have to offer. You know, Jake, we've made the top 10 on this list for years, but we've never been number one. What do you think the shift has been that's making North Carolina so ripe for business right now? It's absolutely fantastic. First of all, I'm very excited to, to be uh, be a part of it here in any small way. But uh, it's been it's been amazing to see the out of state um, capital that's actually come and decided to stay recently is what we've seen a big difference in, especially here in the startup community. Um, we've been able to see a lot easier access to capital for local startups and then ultimately helping them grow into emerging growth companies uh, that are more sustainable. And so I think that's been a big driver in the technology sector specifically uh, here locally. You know, I do want to get into the workforce, Secretary Sanders, because we learned this week one of Raleigh's largest corporate headquarters, Advanced Auto Parts, actually lost $12 million from the state because they couldn't hire enough people. There are, of course, two sides to this. I want to talk first about the incentives piece. The state has been defending these really big tax incentives that have been offered to bigger companies by saying that they are performance based. Does this prove your point? Um, well, you know, the incentives are a tool we have in our toolbox. And yes, it um, is a challenging time uh, for workforce. Um, we, along with all the other states in the nation and frankly globally, are being challenged with our workforce and the labor supply shortage for a number of reasons. But what I am very pleased about is that North Carolina has doubled down on its efforts. We have rolled out a first in talent economic development strategic plan. We are partnering with stakeholders, our university system, education systems, and businesses across the state to ensure that we have a strong pipeline of talent. Organizations like My Future NC uh, working to have 2,000 post-secondary degrees by 2030. So we're doing the work that's required to not only continue to hold on to that asset of talent, but to retain and attract. And you know, Lena, North Carolina is a great place to live and relocate 
So that's only going to help us with our talent pool. You mentioned the incentives being performance-based. Yes, our JDIG incentive is in performance-based, and we work with companies to try to help them hit their targets and objectives. Hmm. Um, those incentives are a great use of taxpayer dollars. You know, Jake, Advanced Auto Parts said it can't meet the targets because of the competitive job market and the popularity of remote work. Do you see this being an ongoing problem for companies just not able to fill jobs? It's an interesting perspective because not every job can be done remotely. Mm -hmm. I think that often we slant towards the technology jobs that are being poached out in the remote for first workforce. That doesn't mean that they can't provide jobs in an environment that's healthy for on the ground or even on the site uh, for some of that work, especially around internships, uh, hiring straight out of college, making sure that that mentorship and training programs are available as well. I mean, ultimately it is still, although we are so first in innovation on so so many things in North Carolina, it is, well, agriculture is still at our back, backbone. So there is a lot of opportunity for a company like Advanced Auto to be able to create blue collar jobs as well as the, the uh, um, innovation based jobs that they have brought over into the area. So I don't I don't want to, to speak against their plan. I don't to pretend to know their business intimately, mm -hmm. but I do think that there is an opportunity for them to have found a more creative way to fill the rest of those jobs. And they still have the opportunity, right? It's not all over. I, I, talking about those blue collar jobs, I did want to play this sound bite. We talked to a local restaurant owner after the CNBC ranking came out, and I want you to take a listen to what he had to say. We just finally got all these this demand, and our issue is, is satisfying it. Like, I, I, if I can't hire enough people to wait on, to wait to serve serve my guests, then it doesn't matter how many guests I have. I, I in fact, I have to turn people away because. I don't have enough qualified people to, to serve them. Really interesting, Secretary Sanders, because he said, look, we can tell that the business environment is thriving and we're excited about the demand, but we just can't find the people to actually staff, you know, our hours. So what is the state doing to make sure that the prosperity isn't isolated to the multi-million dollar companies, but these smaller businesses can grow as well? So within our strategic plan, one of the tactics that we in, uh, list there that we are executing on is to reach out to and tap into underrepresented untapped talent. For example, um, we surely want to target our marginalized population. We are also looking for, the, to, for people with disabilities, such as neurodiverse populations, we're also reaching out to populations um, that have previously uh, involved justice records. So we're tapping those who have not necessarily um, been tapped or maximized in this labor supply uh, shortage that we've seen. So we are doing that. We are also working diligently to understand deeply, or more than so in the past, than in the past what are the business needs? specific for and then offering services and programs to reskill or upskill individuals to prepare them for the restaurant industry or the tourism industry. Hmm. That's some of the things that we're doing. That's fascinating. Tapping into untapped resources. We have much more with our panel on the impact of the state's booming economy coming up next. Plus, we are going to dive into the major takeaways from the January 6th hearings. Stay with us. When you see a WRAL certified accurate forecast, you know it's been verified by the largest team of meteorologists with the most powerful tools in North Carolina. We personally write every alert and send them directly to you so that you'll always know when severe weather is at your doorstep. Tracking severe weather or everyday weather, no matter where or how you watch. Always local, always live, always protecting what matters to you. And that's coverage you can count on. Welcome back. I wanted to dive deeper into the CNBC analysis and look at the categories where the state ranked really well and needs to do some work. So the economy got an A plus, uh, pointing out the 3.4 percent unemployment rate. Technology and innovation got an A plus as well. And access to capital got an A. Really, really good. Not great. Life, health and inclusion got a C minus and the cost of living for our state got a C plus. Now, those two categories there, to me, kind of boil down to quality of life, Jake. 
And they seem like really big challenges for the state. Are companies saying that in terms of when they're coming to you, asking you to help them find employees, that that's a challenge? That's interesting to see that that rating actually that low for the for cost of living, um, especially what way well, I think some of that has to do with just the rapid increase, not necessarily the overall livability. So that might be a skewed skewed data point. We have we're seeing that many companies coming from out of state are still seeing an immense cost savings on their uh, their labor here. Um, though we did see later uh, earlier last year when Apple had announced that their median income for those jobs is going to be in the mid 170s. Many of the folks that I experienced getting that opportunity started at 170, but most of that was stock, and it actually dropped rapidly as the stock stock ended up fluctuating. And so hmm. there's some some pieces on that that actually don't hold up true to where they are being more in line with the median uh, salaries that, that you're seeing from local companies anyway. And so um, I, I would I would almost push back on on it a little bit uh, from the inflation of those salaries. Oh, that's really that they're interesting. announcing. Yeah. Secretary Sanders, the inclusion piece also seems to be really significant there uh, in getting a C minus. What is the state doing to try to make up that gap? Um, so we are working uh, diligently to make sure that when it comes to economic development practices, that we have a lens um, of equity and inclusion on everything we do. We have a sharp focus on rural North Carolina, um, and we are also focused on the disparities that residents have and experience across the state. Um, you mentioned the health and inclusion. Um, you know, this is why we need to expand access one of the reasons why I expect expand access to health care. Fortunately, I believe all three chambers have, or the leadership has stated they support Medicaid expansion, and we are continuing to advocate for Medicaid expansion to the over half a million uh, residents who do not have that, working residents who just fall in that gap of not having access, and I believe 40,000 veterans without access. Healthy workers, healthy communities, and healthy families are is really the makeup for a thriving economy. And when that is done uh, with including everyone in our state, I think that that will significantly impact our health and inclusion scores. And so we are surely doing a number of things to, to do that. And I mentioned the untapped talent previously. Mm -hmm. That is so that we are making sure that we are being inclusive of all in the prosperity uh, that we're seeing and the success that we're seeing here in North Carolina. Really quickly, Jake, is our business success recession proof? People are concerned about that for the end of the year. I think we could be in a bit of a, uh, a bubble of isolation ourselves, as long as there's a state that's always more expensive than us. <laughs> um, so that that is helpful as you're trying to flee. Um, but uh, you know, through two seven, through two thousand seven, eight, nine, you know, we still did very well, at least in the tech sector and manufacturing, uh, and healthcare, and in pharmaceuticals. Here, you know, that was the bulk of the. The, the jobs at that time, um, we still end up having a lot of, of ability to produce in that. And now it seems that we're just adding more to it. So I, I think we're still going to be fine. Hopefully, for the, those of you that are trying to buy a house, you'll see a little bit of a maybe correction yeah. in some of the, that, um, you know, so you don't have as much of that, that crazy frenzy. But ultimately, I think we'll fare still extremely well uh, as long as we're okay. good stewards of what we've done. Secretary Sanders, Jake Shepard, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed that. Coming up, two local historians will put the January 6th hearings into context. Stay with us. You're just one tap away from severe weather alerts, certified accurate forecasts, and control of the only local dual pole radar, all on the Triangle's most popular app designed with you in mind. The WRAL News app. Download it today. Welcome back. Next week could mark the end of historic public hearings from the January 6th committee. It's been a steady stream of new revelations thus far through meticulous evidence gathering and witness testimony. The committee has described a coordinated campaign to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election. 
and argued former President Trump was at the center of the scheme. Now, we should note Republicans have called the hearings partisan. Joining us to discuss the biggest takeaway so far is Nancy McLean, a Duke professor of history and public policy, and Jonathan Weiler, a UNC professor of global studies and co-author of a book called Authoritarianism and Polarization in American Politics. Thanks for joining me. So, Professor McLean, I'll begin with you because you're quoted as saying that these hearings are the most important in our lifetimes. You said, quote, they will help determine whether our country will continue the tradition of the peaceful transfer of power after elections. How so? Well, we now know from the hearings uh, that we've had to date that President Trump was informed by all of his top advisors that he had lost the election, that it was indubitable <laughs> that he had lost the election and President Joe Biden won. And yet he continued to promote the lie that the election had been stolen from him. And we now know from the more recent hearings that he summoned militias to Washington, D.C. He fired them up. And in the full knowledge that they were armed, he sent them to attack the Capitol with the intention of overturning the results of the election. It, literally, this is treason. I mean, we, it's, it's unthinkable that, that the president of a country could have engaged in something that looks very much like treason. I mean, obviously, would still have to go to trial. But, but these charges could not be more serious. And the amount of, of uh, testimony unimpeachable from unimpeachable Republican witnesses inside the White House has shown us that our democracy was under threat to a degree that most of us never even imagined, even those, those of us who are following what happened on January 6th. But also, and I think this is as important, that threat is ongoing. People who believe the big lie in mm. the MAGA faction of the Republican Party are threatening uh, future elections by changing how elections will be run, by making them partisan, and, and in a whole series of other ways, trying to literally um, undermine democratic procedures that have been in place in our country since its beginning. So this could not be more serious. Wow, Professor Weiler, you deal in the information ecosystem. And I was interested in the testimony from a former DOJ official who shared his notes that despite, as we heard from Professor McLean, the former president being told by his closest allies that the election was not stolen, that he said to them, quote, just say that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. What did you make of that testimony? Well, that's, um, I think there's a couple of things that are worth noting here. The first is you have a, an individual Donald Trump whose entire life, uh, his entire adult life as a businessman, as a politician, he's just bullied his way to authority, and to prominence. And he has never been um, constrained by truth or rules or laws. So you have Donald Trump, the man, the personality, who I think all by himself is so dangerous. And then you have a larger ecosystem, a, a, an information ecosystem and a Republican Party ecosystem that has enabled this kind of um, just defiance, disregard for truth procedure um, for a long time now. I mean, and so I think the combination of Trump's own personality and the larger sort of the, the evolution of the Republican Party over a number of years now brought us to the point that, you know, somebody could say what you just quoted and it would sound normal you know, to many people in the room who were responsible for determining whether the president should concede and give up power or whether he should push on with a plan uh, in defiance of all the evidence that he had lost legitimately. Professor McLean, let's talk about the messengers here, though. So obviously the majority of this committee are Democrats. There are two Republicans who are not allies of the former president. Does that make the message that they're trying to communicate more difficult to receive to the public. Is this partisan? 
Uh, well, no, I don't think it is partisan. It's bipartisan. And I want to applaud, I'm a Democrat, but I want to applaud uh, Representative Liv Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, two very heroic, constitutionally minded Republicans who have played very important roles in this. And they are committed Republicans. It's simply not true. Lynn Cheney, I believe, voted with the president 90% of the time on policy. So she's a very committed Republican and a very conservative Republican, but she believes in the Constitution and she believes in honesty and integrity. And I think that's become a dividing line. As Jonathan was saying, you know, we are living in a system of misinformation. And frankly, I don't even say, I, I don't hope I don't get you into trouble, but I don't say Fox News anymore because it's not news. It's, it's systematic misinformation, including a, with the big lie about the election. And so, yes, there are many Republicans who don't believe the committee, who don't believe that the election was legitimately won by Joe Biden, who don't believe there was a pandemic. You know, that that's a real problem. But I think what we have seen from these hearings and from polling and focus groups that have been done since the hearings is that probably up to about one in five Republicans is taking this very seriously and that Dem uh, independents have shifted dramatically yeah. with the hearings and that all want to see accountability. You and know, I, think I, I have to push back, Professor McLean, because mm -hmm. you say Fox News isn't news. Millions of people watch Fox News. It matters that all Americans are getting access to correct information. If they're not getting that news, isn't that a problem? Yes, people absolutely need to have access to legitimate fact based news. But what we see with these Fox hosts and communication scholars have, have demonstrated this, you know, in multiple studies, they are not getting fact-based empirical news content, what they are getting is identity coaching and provocation and the cultivation of a kind of tribal mindset, which leads believers to follow the president. I thought one of the most effective witnesses in uh, the last hearing was a man named uh, Stephen Ayers, who was a rank and file Republican, right. a factory supervisor from Ohio, a family man who said he had horse blinders on. He was only listening to those new sources, you know, the social media that was full of lies. So he came to Washington and took part in the break into the Capitol and it ruined his life. And he said, you know, if he could do it over again, he would have done his own research. He would have checked other sources. He would have known that he was being had by this president right. that he had trusted. So I think, you know, some of these Republican witnesses have been the most important um, eye openers in our culture to say, you know, they're all saying they were had or they tried to stop the president from doing which what literally is not only against the Constitution, but if proven, it's criminal conspiracy. The bottom line the election. Exactly. The bottom line, though, is that the responsibility is on leaders to make sure yes. that the entire American public is getting information that is accurate. Professor Weiler, what is the end game for this committee? Well, I think the committee I think they have two main purposes. One, I think, is to provide as detailed and accurate a record as possible of what happened, and specifically to your point of the central role that Donald Trump himself played in organizing this entire conspiracy to overthrow the election. And I think to um, Professor McLean's point about the gentleman from Ohio, the power of leaders, the power of demagogues to influence and shape the thinking of ordinary people is something that I think especially more sort of politically attuned folks have a hard time believing. We all want to believe that we just think for ourselves. But the fact is we're all susceptible to some degree to the, the air we breathe, the larger information sources around us. And when you have a demagogue like Trump who is so committed mm -hmm. to spreading the falsehoods he is, he can be incredibly dangerous because people will follow him mm -hmm. in the ways that we've seen throughout the course of these hearings. Well, there's more to come next week. Professors McLean and Weiler, thank you so much for your time and insight. The next and possibly final hearing is expected to air during prime time on July 21st, and you can count on WRAL to carry that live. Thank you so much for joining us as well. If you have any comments, you can find me on social media, WRAL Lena Tillet on Facebook. Get breaking news in the palm of your hand with custom push alerts, stories that matter to you, and award-winning coverage.
all on the Triangle's most popular app, designed with you in mind. The WRAL News app. Download it today.